Hey friends, Mike Myers here with the Song Rang for Guitar podcast, episode number 35, Christian Burns. I am super stoked to announce that the Song Rang for Guitar five-day boot camp is coming back. I hosted one back in February and over 400 songwriters participated. If you're a songwriting guitarist that's just stuck in a rut using the same chord shapes over and over, you've got strumming patterns, you can't even tell me what your strumming patterns, you just have this default strumming pattern. You're trying to write for other artists, you want to write in other genres, you want to get into sync licensing, you just want to be a better songwriting guitarist, you want to control the guitar and not have the guitar control you, you got to sign up for this. So all I want you to do is go to songwritingforguitar.com slash bootcamp to register. Everything is going to kick off May 10th. I'm going to be going live every single day for a week, giving you actionable bite-sized tips that you can start applying to your songwriting. I'm giving away some amazing prizes. I'm going to have some special guests. So it is ridiculous that you wouldn't do this because it is absolutely free. All you got to do is go to songwritingforguitar.com slash bootcamp to register. Now, Christian has written for some of electronic music's elite, like Tiesto, BT. He's also one-third of the multi-million record-selling Brit band BB Mac. They conquered the UK's Top 40 charts and the US Billboard Top 100. Christian knows his shit when it comes to songwriting, top-lining, vocal production, and we're going to get into all of that because he has a very unique perspective and system. And I love the story of those that are not only doing the thing, but more importantly, they're helping others do that thing as well. So we're going to dive into it. Episode number 35, Christian Burns. We've chatted before, and I knew a little bit of what you did, but it, it was to the full extent when I was like, oh, I'll have Christian on the podcast. I'll see what he's done. And I was like researching. I was like, well, shit. I was like, he's t- like... Okay, so that song charted, that song charted. Oh, it also charted. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and I want to get into all that shit, but I want to know, I feel like for everyone, there's a catalyst. There's a starting point where you get, oh, music's my thing. Music starts to be my thing. Was there a point in your life at some point, like, you know, when you were growing up where music was introduced and you immediately were like, that's my thing right there? For me, you know, music's always been, it's always been my passion, you know, and I, I guess, my, well, my mum and dad have always uh, been into music and they were musicians. My dad was uh, in the 60s, he was, he was in a band who was signed to Decca Records and they opened up for the Beatles at the Cavern Club and, Shit. you know, all this history in the family. And so I was brought up around, you know, my dad playing the guitar around the house and just, I was just surrounded by music from as early as I can remember. I've always loved it. I've always been fascinated as well with 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 technology and music and, you know, synthesizers and just everything about it, you know, and the create yeah. creating music. So I, I think when I was younger, like a lot of people, you know, you, you, you love it and you, but you see it as kind of, kind of a, as a hobby at first. And you think this is something I enjoy. This is something I enjoy doing, but I, I've got to get a proper job, you know, I've got to get a proper job. And it's like, it wasn't until I, I got a little bit older and I did, the proper job thing and I was like oh this isn't fun <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know and I was like okay I, I, I made a big decision you know it's 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 all about the, the work you do in, in life is it's all about doing whether whether it be music yeah. or whether whatever it is it's about doing something you love it's a big part of your life and um and an opportunity came up for me well I, I, an opportunity in my mind you know I, I kind of had this idea and you know I met Mark and Steve from BB Mac, and we, I thought, you know what, let's just go for this because, um, what's the worst that can happen? You know, we were young, I was a bit older than them, but we just went for it, you know, and I thought, let's know. Because I'd still be, I'd always done music as a hobby, yeah, Mike, you know what I mean? Like, I've always been in bands and bits of bands and cover bands, and you know, my first band was when I was 12, but uh, it was when I was like 24, 25, I decided to take it, um. Yeah, take this seriously. Let's have a crack at this now, you know? Now, I like, I find that interesting as you mentioned, like sometimes music is a hobby. I feel that's also culturally how people treat music. It's not really with a lot of things, but when you start a band, they go, oh, that's nice. You write songs. That's sweet. So, what do you really do for a living? What do you do as your job? And (laughs) did you feel like that, that sort of like, I don't know, mentality just kind of like, I guess this has to be a hobby. And then, at what point, because I feel people always dance around that line of like, I'm going to do the thing, I'm going to do the thing, and they never fucking do the thing. Was there a breaking point where you realize like, shit, you know what, like, 
I just got to do this. Like, I'm not, I hate this job. This is dumb. And it's just like, I don't want this to be the thing that I do. For me, you know, I, I think it all comes down to, you know, your mindset. And, and, and I, I never, never, ever wanted to be one of those people who said, what would have happened if, you know, I wonder if, mm. you know, I mean, it, it, the, the, the last thing you want when you're, when you're on your deathbed is regrets. That I should have done this, you know, it, we're here for a short time. And I, I made this decision. It was a few decisions, you know, I was, I was a lot younger and I just made the decision. I want to do what I love. And, you know, I, I, why not? Why not me? Why, why can't I do that? Why do people, other people do it? Why not me? And, and I just had this, um, this switch in my mind and just, just went for it. You know, I, I, th- I think it's a big thing. It's, it, it's like getting out of your comfort zone, you know, yeah. it's about pushing yourself and, you know, you can, you, you can do anything if you set your mind to it, Mike. It's really, it's really that simple. It's like you can do anything if you really want it. My dad always told me, and I was, you know, I'm lucky that my dad was always very positive. My dad never forced me to do it. My parents never forced me to study the violin or do, you know. But my, what they let me do things, whatever I wanted to do when I was a kid growing up. But one thing my dad always did say to me, he said, "Son, you know, if you want it bad enough, if you really, really want it, yeah, you, you will get it. Whatever it is in life." And I guess I just really wanted you know, this to, to do music. And yeah, here I am, you know, 25 odd years later, whatever, still doing something I love every day. And it feel, you know, it's amazing. That's, that's an amazing thing for me. It's a, it's a, it, it listen, it's an emotional roller coaster being in the music industry, let's be honest. <laughs> but it's, you know, I love my job, you know, yeah. and um, it doesn't feel like works some days, some days it definitely does. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. You say the mindset and I feel that is, that kind of preps you for those moments. Yeah. Where it's just like, Oh, this is my job. I can't believe I get to do this. And the days where you're like, fuck, <clears throat> this is shit. And, but you power through it anyway, because it's like, Nope, I got to keep on going with it. It's like, it's not going to be perfect all the time, but this is still what I love doing. One of the things I've learned is that nothing is perfect, you know, and this is something that can, it can hold people back, you mm-hmm. know, I'm trying to be a perfectionist, you know, there's, there's no such thing as, as 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 perfect because you know it's very subjective. What, what I might think is perfect, you might not, and vice versa. So I think yeah. that's you know good a good point you brought up about you know knowing when something's finished and knowing when to step away from something and not keep playing with something until it's broken. Mm. <laughs> you know because you can do that with music and with songwriting. I'm sure you've been there, but yeah, you know it just. I, I, I love it. I love music and it just, it was definitely a mindset shift. I wanted to do something I loved um, and I decided just to throw myself in fully to that years ago and never look back. Mike. And when you made that switch and you're, you're starting and you're collaborating and you're 24 and you're like, shit, I'm going to do this. How did the songwriting process change from you? Let's say from when you were like, quote unquote, hobby songwriting and guitar to eventually like, okay, pedal to the metal, this is the thing that we're going to do. How did that change? What was that shift like? Yeah, well, I think for me, you know, my, my early songs, the first songs I wrote were were when I was um, like 12, you know, my first band. And we we had, I was in a band called No Exit. And, it, you know, some of my mates, it was, it was amazing. You know, we just, that's what it's all about for me. We just yeah. loved playing these Beatles because we did mostly covers of Beatles songs. And we wrote a few of our own and we peppered them into the show, you know, but we were only 12. And, you know, I look back at them now and the lyrics are so cliche and, you know, everything rhymes really. Well. And it's just, it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of mistakes. When you say, we say mistakes, you know, as, as opposed to oh, that's a bit, oh, that's cheesy or this is a bit, you know, yeah, uh, bad form, to, uh, you know, as far as songwriting goes, but it's all about, a learning process and you know the more you write the more you practice the better you get and you know I, I i i just pushed on with the writing and it was hard it was really hard i'll be honest you know when i started to get older and take it seriously when i was in my early 20s and you know suffering from writer's block and all this stuff because i didn't know i didn't know the correct things to do when to write a song you know i didn't know the tricks and you know certain things because back then when i started there was no there was no support. There was no, there were no um, online courses or, you know, anything like that yeah. to help you. So it was kind of just figure it out. Um, but I was lucky with BB Mac. We, oh, we did the rounds. We worked, you know, we 
we met with everyone, you know, even in Sweden, and we met with Max Martin, and we, we, we wrote songs with all these Swedish people, you know, the Swedish powerhouse writers, and then in America, and I got to get in the room with, you know, Desmond Childs, and People oh, who wrote, okay. you know, Living on a Prayer and stuff like big songs like that. And so, I, you know, I, I took all this in like a sponge. I was very lucky to be thrown into that situation. Do you know, 2000, as far as like, as far as my production skills and engineering skills and how to, you know, record vocals and everything else, I was, I was like watching like a hawk, you know, because I was like, this is an opportunity for me. And I'm so glad I did, you know. I just learned from some of the amazing songwriters and, and some of the stuff I figured out myself and some of the stuff I even developed myself, some of my methods um, to get me where I am today, you know, uh, which is a place where I love, I love songwriting. I don't get stuck anymore, which is fun. And, you know, I just, I, I've, I've got a system down now where it just enables me to enjoy every, every part of the whole, you know, songwriting stages really. That seems like that's that's like a fucking college degree right there. All of that, which is not in a college degree that you would find. Like everything that you said, I went here and writing with Desmond Child. I, I love Butch Walker and he tells a story where his metal band wrote a song with Desmond Child and he used the word love and Desmond goes, what do you know about love? You're only a child. <laughs> you know, he was just like, and it's just like, but it's like what you described is a schooling essentially in craft that, I don't know, you can't find in a college or a university. It's like experience. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it, it, I was lucky and it, you, you couldn't find it. You still can't find that, you know? That is crazy. One thing I'd love to know, at what point did you guys, as you were writing, that you felt like, I hear people say, oh, this is a good song. Like this is, you know, even that phrase, good song. You know, what is a good song? What is a song that you know, I guess to phrase instead, what's a song that suddenly this may have traction. This may get like some momentum. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, you know, I think yeah. when people say, hey, how do you write a hit? You know, can you, <laughs> you know, how do you know when you've written a hit? How do you write a hit? I think, I think you can't go into a session with that. There's no, there's, there's nobody knows. There's a secret thing that goes on in certain songs that just happens and it's like, wow. But one thing I can say is that if you listen to a song all the way through, and there's nothing niggling you, you know, there's no like lumpy bits or no bits that you're not happy with. And you love listening to the song all the way through. And you, you know what? I want to put it on again. I want to, I just really enjoy yeah. listening to this. Okay. I think once you go with your gut and you feel it's as good as it can be, I think you're onto something. But I think, you know, the, the, like when we wrote Back Here, which is one of our biggest hits, you know, it was like it was number one for 12 weeks in America. And we didn't, you know, when we, when we wrote this track, we didn't realise, we just thought it was a good song. You know, we didn't know, oh, that's a hit song. But I tell you what, when we did get the produced version back off all over Libra with the guitar, we thought this is different for the time. It was very different, very striking kind of acoustic intro to the song. And it was different to everything else that was very R&B and poppy at the time. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, but I just remember I wanted to listen to it again. I wanted to listen to it again. And you have a certain feeling with certain songs. And, you know, you know, this is really good. And listen, you don't know what's going to be a hit and what's not because there's so many other factors that go into it. You know, it's 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 got to be the perfect storm. It's not just about the song's quality. You know, it's about everything else, the marketing and everything else. But I think you get a certain feeling with some songs. And usually, Mike, usually it's the ones that were the easiest to write. You know, it's the ones that were the easiest to write when you get into that kind of the zone, you know, or yeah. the flow state or whatever you want to call it. When you get in, it just feels so easy to write. I think on, on, on like, you know, eight, nine times out of 10, my biggest hits and songs have, have been these ones that have been easy to write. So I think it's about, you know, putting yourself in, giving yourself as much chance as possible to write a hit by setting the scene, setting, making sure conditions are perfect when you're writing and, you know, there's no distractions, stuff like that. I'm just making sure you can get in the zone because I find when you're in the zone and you can really, you know, it's easy, that that's when you get the best stuff most of the time, Mike. I in am my so, humble opinion. In your, your form, I mean, your opinion definitely counts because you've done, sh you've done well. I mean, it's interesting. You say 12 weeks in America and I'm always fascinated because I feel like it's changed, but then... I remember having a discussion, maybe this was like 2004 with 
um, th- there was a manager that messaged us, my band back in MySpace, which is a very dated phrase to say. And he was like, MySpace, hey, and he was like, hey, you know, I want to talk to you guys about your band. And then I talked to him and he was based in the UK and he was like, he manages this one band. He was like, I'll send you a CD. They're trying to break into America. And I was like, I, and he was like, have you heard of McFly? And I was like, I don't know who that is. And so he sent me their CD and it's like, I listened. I was like, oh, those guys are do something. And they never really made it in America. It never made an impact. He was like, they're going to be in a movie. They're going to do this thing. And it's like, we're trying to really make that ground for they can break through in America. And the movie never really took off. And it just didn't like, how was the condition for you guys to make that jump? I know there's lots of different factors that come into play, but what was especially during that period? Because I feel like doing well in the UK, awesome. But then even doing well in America, it's just like, that's another animal in itself absolutely it is a different beast you know funny story actually mcfly when they did the auditions to get the band together there it was there was it was on tv a few years ago there was, there was um a documentary about them and they all had to go and sing back here in the audition so they were obviously you know we've, we've seen baby mark and we want to model this band another band you know like yeah. baby mark so they used back here in the auditions <laughs> Uh, which is very flattering, of course. And they've done, those guys have gone to do so well over in the UK and another place in the world, you know, the massive. But I think the, the, one of the reasons for our success, well, there was a couple of reasons, you know, we, we were, it was something different and fresh at the time, you know, mm. and we were these English guys who came over and we sounded different to everything else, you know, we sounded so different to everything else that was on the radio. And we had, you know, we had great songs and we were, we were hard working, Mike. You know, we we put the time in, and you know, it, it, there's there's so many factors that come into the success. You know, there was there was one guy at the radio station in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, who championed back here, and he he kind of heard it when he was over on his holidays in the UK and took the single back, and he started playing it. In fact, he played on his radio station, and said, "I love this song so much, I'm going to play it again," and he played it again, <laughs> and it just started growing from you know little things like that happened, and then it grew from there really. But we put we put the time in. I think it's the, again, it's the perfect storm. It's, it's being prepared to do the work, you know, yeah. doing the work, um, having a great, something different, you know, ha- having a great song as well. And yeah, just, you know, a little bit of look sprinkled in, but you know, you, 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 look is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. So we were prepared. We practiced so much and we just, we, you know, we were writing so much and we were ready um, to do the work as well. Then when you kind of closed the door on that group and moved on to your own songwriting and kept on going, what were things that you took from that and lessons like of just like, that works well, I think I'd do that differently now. Were there things that you then, it's almost like you used that as a template as you were moving on on things that you wanted to do and things that you wanted to avoid because you've been through it. Listen, I'm 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 always learning. Even even now, Mike, you yeah. know, I'm sure like yourself, I'm I'm always reading books and, you know, d- doing some you know tutorials myself, and always want to learn and and improve myself. So it's more of a journey, really. You know, there's there's so much I've learned from from the BB Max stuff, and then you know I, I've learned so much in the electronic world since I've you know I mean I started my first big hit in the dance world was with Tiesto in in 2007, and I've worked. You know, since then, for the past 15 years, I've, I've gotten to work with some of the biggest names. You know, I've been blessed to work with people like Armin van Buren and BT and, you know, Benny Benassi and all these guys. And I've learned so much from working with these people as well, because in some ways, you know, it's a different kind of approach when you're writing for an electronic song, like with a Tiesto or an Armin van Buren, you know, to when you're working with, in a pop group, you know, for Top 40 Radio in America or, or whatever. So, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's different approaches. It's different approaches. But, you know, I, I've learned, I'm, I'm still learning now, basically, Mike, you know, so, and I, I love that. I love that. It never ends. The journey never, ever ends. I feel like your specialty, too, is focusing on great vocal deliveries and great vocal arrangements. I feel that's like you could have the best production in the world. You could have, you know, all the bells and whistles. Everything could be so tight. But if the vocal arrangement sucks, if it's just like the vocal delivery sucks, it, it, or and it's just, and when I say sucks, it's like, it's just not reaching a level of where it's like, it's not the same level as that vocal production. What are, some, what are some things that make 
to consider because I know when people are like, I'm going to demo my song, I'm going to put together, I'm going to do a vocal arrangement. Where do I start? Like, (laughs) where do you go? Yeah, I mean, I think you're spot on. It's like, it's getting easier and easier to get a decent sounding track together now, you know, with things like Splice and MIDI files. And as far as songwriting, you know, plugins, like intelligent plugins, like Soothe 2 and mixing plugins and all these different things you've got to help you. But, you know, as good as your track is, as as amazing as your, your drum sound and everything else and your guitars, if you come in with a vocal that's just like, Overtuned, uh, you know, muffly, too sibilant, uh, not aligned properly. It's just going to sound cheap, and it's just going to bring like the Titanic, the rest of the track down to that level, you know. And it's like you can really ruin a uh, ruin a vocal very easily, you know. Over compress it, you know. Over tune it, um, you know. Don't pay attention to the sibilants. All these things, the acoustics in the room are wrong, you know. Bad recordings. And it, what it does, it just cheapens the whole song. So you're very, you're spot on. Uh, it's it's a bit, it's a bit of a epidemic actually um, about vocals because a lot of producers they, they they don't understand that you know the vocal it has to be the if you've got vocal in a song unless it's used as an effect it has to be the star of the show. You know everything else is just a vehicle to carry this message. Um, so it's really important to to get the levels of emotion c- correct and everything. You want to make sure that vocal is just presented in its best light possible. And you know things like overtuning vocals it just cheapens it and, it, and it also distracts people from the magic, you know, and you're getting lost in that song. So I think spending the time to understand vocals and you know how to how to produce vocals because the vocal it's the most dynamic. Yeah. instrument you know in the whole world you know it, it's it's the hardest thing most complex instrument most dynamic instrument and you need to really put the time into the vocal because you know it is everything it is the emotion and you want that message to be clear you want it to cut through the mix you want people to hear the lyric and the emotion and you know having working really well as the whole unit um but you're right you know so i think don't tune everything if it doesn't need tuning. That's one thing you can do. Um, you know, spend more time on the acoustics in your room and and look at the sound you're getting before you even hit record. You know, because look at that as the top of your, of your of your vocal chain is your room. And I think too many people don't do that. They just they just grab a mic and they think I buy this mic and it's going to sound great, or buy this plug in, it's going to sound great. And it's not like that with the vocal. It's the it's the layers and it's the processing and it's the way you do it and in the order you do it. Uh, to get it as good as it can be, you know? What would you say are some of the, you know, especially now people are like, oh, you know, it's locked down. I can record my songs. I'm going to record my vocals. What are some things that they're, you know, you talk about, you know, the the setup of the room. What are some things that people are probably doing wrong right now that they don't realize it and they think it sounds great? <laughs> yeah, no, totally. And, uh, you know, I think the, the goal is when you're working with a vocal, you know, people think that when they're EQing, they're cleaning out your, your vocal and they, cle- they think you clean out your vocal, but you're not, you're actually cleaning out the frequencies from the room. So I think anything you can do to put yourself in a space where there's going to be less hard surfaces, you know? So mm. if you are recording at home, you can get an incredible sound now at home and it doesn't have to cost you the earth at all. You know, you can go on Amazon and get yourself some, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a, a specific room you're recording, get some of those, uh, you know, acoustic tiles and some of the sponge you know some of these these tiles you can put up wherever they do help deaden the sound because the goal is is to get a drier sounding vocal as possible so that you can put reverb on and everything else inside the computer and just like you know if you focus on getting the best quality recording at at source then it's going to be a lot easier because the less work you have to do inside the computer the less finessing the more the more of the human element you're going to keep to the vocal and the more the character you're going to keep to the vocal you're going to keep in the vocal and that's really important because you know the vocal at the end of the day that's what i'm saying you know you don't want to hear the tuning if you can hear it's being tuned you're doing it you're doing it wrong (laughs) it's got to be transparent and the less you have to do to finesse it inside the computer the better it's going to sound really 
the big thing I'm hearing is like, because the human element is like the emotion. And it's like, and if you're doing that, you're killing basically the whole feel and vibe of the song, which at the end of the day is like the most fucking important thing is the human feel yeah. and that emotion in the song. Yeah, totally. And it, it just, it distracts. If people hear too much sibilance or people hear over tuning or whatever, however um, good the song is, whatever, it, if it's really distracting, it's just going to, take a layer of that engagement away from the, from the message, you know? So you want to do everything you can to make the message as clear and as nice sounding as possible, in my opinion, you know? I think it's really important um, to spend the time on a vocal and the attention to detail, you know? Because that, that was another big yeah. thing for me. Like, you know what, I, I thought at first that it was going to be like, hey, you know what, get this plug in or you know, buy this Neumann U87 mic and that's it, you know, that's it. That's going to be great. And it's like... It's not, and it's when you start to do all the details, like you know, the cross fading and the, the breath taming and the aligning, the sibilance, everything else. When you add more together, then you start to go, "Wow, this sounds, oh, this sounds, this sounds great now." You know, and it's, that, and it's that difference between something that's amateur sounding and something that you can just drop into a record. You know, yeah. Um, but it's all doable at home now, you know, stick to it, stick to it. You know, my advice is stick to like a bedroom. If you haven't got a studio and you want to record vocals, stick to a bedroom, anywhere with loads of soft furnishings. That really helps a lot, you know, and close any curtains. If you're in a room with big windows and stay away from any conservatories or kitchens or anything with a lot of hard surfaces, you want that the driest kind of sound of the vocal going in as possible, really. How do you view harmonies when it comes to song? Like, you know, people are like, oh, this needs a harmony. When do you, as you listen, and it can be based on song, you know, as the song goes along, but are there things in your mind that you're always like, that needs a harmony, that probably needs doubled? Because I know there are people that are against doubling that go, no, 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 don't double your vocal. It's like, you're going to kill it. Oh, no, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of doubling vocals. I think for me, when I'm writing, you know, um, I'm producing, it's about contrast. It's about having the contrast in, a, in, a, in an arrangement, in a song. So you can you can inject contrast in so many ways, you know, in so many ways. But one of them is, is, is for doubling vocals and, you know, using harmonies. And I also use harmonies as well to spotlight phrases as well from time to time. So mm -hmm. it's, it can be a tool they use to, to just bring attention to certain parts and obviously you know chorus is great to put harmonies in there and there's, there's so many different kind of uh, combinations of harmonies you can do but yeah I'm, I'm a big fan of harmonies and like you know obviously with the bb max stuff <clears throat> we used to do a lot of harmonies um three-part harmonies but we'd, we'd do all kinds of octaves and all kinds of crazy harmonies but you know coming from that background it's interesting because I, I do carry that on in a lot of my music now and even in the stuff I'm doing now, you know, the, a lot of the dance electronic stuff and the deep house stuff, I, I do use a lot of harmonies. Um, I'm a big fan, and I think it's a great way you can add a, a lot of a lot of contrast to your vocal productions, uh, and, and you know, and ultimately to you to your song. What you said right there, like highlighting certain lines, I feel like sometimes it can be lyric highlighter for very important phrases when it's there because it's like you notice it and you're like, oh. And it's just like that line stood out more. The hook in the song stood out because you really raised it. Absolutely. What do you do when people come to you and they go, oh, hey, I'm terrible at melodies. I'm awful at melody. Like, what's a good melody? You know, why, why isn't this, the, you know, I got feedback on, from the song and they said this melody is terrible. What is usually too when it comes to a, a good melody? I think, you know, a, a good melody, it's, uh, you know, and, I, 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 you know, this is obviously... A, if you've got three hours to talk about this, we could talk about it, but there's a lot goes into it. But I think ultimately, you know, you've got to just feel it. And if you're not feeling it, then don't keep it, you know, and just keep going and go with your gut. And, and you, you, you've yeah. got to always remember with, with melody. I mean, there, there are obviously things you can do and certain techniques. And, and you know, I, I, I do cover a lot of this stuff with my students, it's, but it's, it's so in depth. But I think you just go with your gut and don't be afraid to uh, don't use something, you know? And, and, I, and I always think, think to yourself, right, is, does this move me? Does this feel amazing or does it just feel okay? And you've got to think, you know what, if it just feels okay, well, what are other people going to think? You know, oh, this is okay. You know, you, you, you've got to keep it. Um, I, I, one thing I will say, a lot, a lot of time is, is, is less is more. It's less is more, I will say, with melody. I think, you know, for some people, 
especially at the beginning of the journey, they feel like they've got to fill the whole song with constant melody. And it, 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 you don't have to. In fact, it's it's better if you don't because there's there's you know I I say that there's um there's sadness in the silence. You know that's in the silent parts is where you can add a lot of emotion. So it's just learning when to inject the sounds when to stop singing and, and how to make it catchy you know melodies you want it to be catchy you know keep it simple keep it simple that's one thing i would say you know um a lot of the time is is, is, is just keep it simple the human brain I, is an amazing <laughs> it's an amazing machine but you throw too much information at it at the same time and you know it's gonna it's gonna struggle so you know i would just say keep it simple and just go with, with whether you're feeling it I love that idea of the breath, like allowing allowing moments of pause and breath because like our sentence structure is never the same. We're never talking at the same rate. Our sentence structure and our pauses are different that that should come through in our delivery because yeah, you, you don't want to berate or like bombard the listener with just like, no, 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 no. And it's just like, it's hard. Like sometimes the best hook is so simple. Like, if I go back to like you in your Beatles cover band, do you feel like that was a good schooling too of just like breaking down songs and seeing like, well, what's a, what's a good, what made this hooky? Absolutely. And I didn't, you know, I didn't realize I was doing it. I didn't realize yeah. I was doing it at the time, but what I was doing, I was, you know, we were just like mimicking the Beatles and it's like some of those things definitely going to rub off. And I think, you know, one thing is the Beatles had really catchy, catchy hooks and, you know, I mean, just, just amazing songs. I could just sit here and talk about <laughs> the Beatles for now, but I think definitely I, I, I'm a sum of all, you know, the people I've listened to over the years and, you know, I used to love bands like the Eagles, the Beatles, um, ELO. I used to love a lot of these big harmony, vocal harmony um bands so definitely has rubbed off on me absolutely that's awesome so if people are listening and they're like damn i need to go to christian for advice i know that you're starting you you do coaching you're starting to develop could you tell me about this course that you're putting together because i'd love to know about this i find this is going to be super helpful for people yeah yeah of course yeah no what it was i mean it was all it was all by accident really so i i me and bt um my you know, good friend uh, for a long time. And we, we actually got a band together called All Hail the Silence. Um, well, we, we decided to start a label. So a couple of years ago, under the radar, we started a label and um, it's called Cassette Recordings. And we're going to, you know, launch it in a, in a couple of months. And, you know, we've, we've signed about nine artists over the past couple of years and we've been developing them. And, you know, I, I noticed, like what we mentioned before, some of the producers... As amazing, talented as they are, you know, and some of them were signing and they were just instrumentals and it's amazing stuff. Um, but when it came to the vocals, they were struggling, some of them, on on lyrics, on melodies and, you know, on vocal production and quality of vocals. So I was like, I can help them. I can help them. You know, and I obviously want the releases to be the best they can be. So I started doing Zooms like this, you know, one on one with, with some of the some of the. the the, the sign the sign people some of the artists and it, it was going well but i really had to go and i was like i can't do this all every week i've got I've got my own i've got albums to write i've got gigs to do i'm i'm you know this is not a good use of my time it's great that i'm helping them so i thought right i'll put some videos together and then mm -hmm. i can record these and help them so i started doing that and sending them off to them and, and results were great and I, and then i had this epiphany i was like you know what i can i can help much you know many more people than just the people signed to the roster so i thought and also you know a lot of people i get questions all the time mike about you know hey how do you do harmonies and how, you know how do you get that sound on this song and what do you know blah blah how do you write so, so i was i was getting all these questions from 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 all kinds of people and people on you know on social media and fans even at shows so i thought I'll just put something together that's going to help and, you know, empower artists. And that's the whole thing, really. I'm about empowerment and, you know, it's about empowering the artist within. So I decided to, I had this aha moment. So I, I started the Record Ready Academy, which is, it's very early stages. But yeah, I launched my first course last December called Record Ready Vocals. And it's been, you know, a massive success and you know, I've had some great testimonials so far. And it was, it was great because I spent so long in lockdown making this course. And I was like, I hope people like it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I started getting people through the course. And yeah, yeah it's just been, 
it's been amazing to see the results I've been getting and the testimonials coming in. So that was the start of it all, really, for me. And then I decided to go one more with that mic, and I said, right, well, I can, you know, I'm, I can teach people, you know, how to record your vocals and and, and record ready vocals. It's complete. It's a complete step-by-step process of vocal mastery. So if you do want to learn vocals or, you know, um, produce your own songs, um, this is a no-brainer. This is everything you need to know about recording vocals. So I was like, right, that's great. That's ticked off. And then I had my students, they were asking me, it's like, can you teach me this now? So I was like, okay. So I, I put together, this called the Top Line Masterclass. I've just put it together now, actually, and I, I'm starting my first group coaching um, class in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks. So it's going to be me, you know, coming on a Zoom every week like this and teaching them on over a 12-week program, um, which is everything, you know, from s- lyrics to melodies to, you know, production, mixing, mastering, everything, mindset. You know, I go through the whole works and and that's what's been taking up my, all my time. It's kept me, you know, creating the academy, Mike. It's kept my sanity throughout this whole <laughs> lockdown so i'm just yeah it, it it feels amazing to be doing something that i know is helping a lot of people um i see a lot of people struggling and i see a lot of people getting ripped off as well <laughs> by shoddy producers taking the money um rec- you know recording the vocals and tuning them and i'm listening going that's doesn't sound very good how much did you pay for that i'm like oh two grand i'm like what you know so <laughs> i'm like listen i can help you learn how to do this yourself and then no one can hold you back then, you know? So that's my, that's my mission is to help as many musicians kind of take on, the take the power themselves and, and not have anything stop them to get in from where they want to be. So uh, it's something I started a couple of years ago. It's been a lot more work than I thought. I know you do <laughs> something silly. So it's, it's a lot of work goes into this content and a lot of hours, but it's but it's amazing now. So I'm at the point now where I'm enjoying seeing the students come through and I'm excited about the next thing I'm working on. And I've got plans, yeah, plans to take this even further this year. So, yeah, I'm excited about that. So, yeah, check it out. Record Ready Vocals is the course. And, um, yeah, that's what I've been that's what I've been doing for the past <laughs> two years. If they want to find out about the course, follow you. Where can they go? Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram. It's Christian Burns underscore. You can, I, I go on Clubhouse every Tuesday, sorry, every Wednesday and Thursday night um, from 9 p.m. Eastern time. Um, me and BT are on there and we're talking about all kinds to do with, you know, helping musicians and talking about AI and talking about, you know, um, everything, plugins. It's a lot of nerdy stuff, but it's a lot of fun. And also, you, you know, you can check out uh, the Record Ready Academy, sorry, recordreadyacademy.com and you can check out, you know, any, everything I've got going on there. And yeah, I'm on Facebook, you know, usual places, Twitter. And oh, oh, by the way, on Clubhouse, my screen name is at musician. I was quite happy with that. I got that, I got that screen name. <laughs> that was an early Clubhouse find that you were like, shit, yeah. no one has this name. I got it. <laughs> I'm having it. Dude, Christian, thank you so much for doing this. This was awesome. No, no worries, mate. Listen, it's been fun, mate. It's good to see you. Good to see you, mate. All right, friends, that does it for this week's episode. It was edited and produced by Chris Fafalius. I'm Mike Myers. Thanks for listening.